Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. A crushed car and one woman killed. Officers finding an off-duty officer at the scene in an open can of alcohol. But why was the San Marcos police sergeant returned to duty? The explanation coming up in a Defenders debrief. Plus, a fight for survival in South Louisiana. No power, no food, and for many, no way to leave because they can't find gas. The latest on that dire situation. Good morning, I'm Max Massey, and we are talking about the second annual San Antonio Beer Run. And of course, we're doing it right here at Second Pitch Beer Company. We're going to talk about what it means for the community and how you can get involved. And a good morning to you. It is Wednesday, September 1st. Happy Wednesday, happy September, and we're starting off hot for September. It's very humid out there. I don't think we've hardly dipped below 80 degrees this morning. Here's meteorologist Justin Horn as we go outside with live cam. Justin. Hey there, good morning, guys. Uh, you're right about the humidity. It is very thick, and that's why I think heat index values are going to jump uh, up above 100 today. We got up to about 100 yesterday when it comes to the heat index. Today it could be a little bit worse. So let's talk about the heat index right now. We're at 87. That's what it feels like outside and it's only nine o'clock in the morning. So that gives you a good idea of what we're looking for this afternoon. Next few days, we'll see those temperatures in the upper 90s. There is a slight chance for a stray storm or two during the afternoon, but the anything we see is going to be few and far between. And uh, as we look at the pollen count, everything's low. We did add a few allergens today, pigweed, fall elm and ragweed in the mix, but uh, all again on the low category. Uh, do want to keep in mind or want to pass along that, that today is a case at uh, what's well, power saver CPS energy peak energy demand day. They're asking that, that you lower your energy between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. just because that heat and humidity will be uh, there this afternoon. Again, temperatures up around 97, 20 percent chance of rain 3 p.m. through about 5 p.m. What about cold fronts? Do we have any in the forecast? We're going to look at that climatology for you coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. All right. Thanks, Justin. Let's look at today's nine at nine. Tropical Depression Ida continues to push through the U.S., expected to bring flooding rains to parts of the Tennessee and Ohio valleys today. Over a million people in Louisiana remain without power. The New Orleans airport canceled all flights for the third day in a row. As America refocuses on national security and domestic issues, so are the Taliban facing the struggle of building a working government and country. They have promised freedom to anyone wanting out of Afghanistan in return for resources from other nations. They say without trade and support, their victory won't last long. President Biden will meet with the president of Ukraine today. Their agenda includes discussions on increased military aid and backing for Ukraine's bid for NATO membership. Ahead of today's meeting, the White House said it would commit up to $60 million in new military aid to Ukraine. Five people are missing after a U.S. Navy helicopter crashed off the San Diego coast yesterday. The Navy says the chopper crashed into the ocean while it was doing routine flight operations. Six people were on board, but only one has been recovered so far. A controversial Texas abortion law is now in effect. The law bans abortions when a fetal heartbeat is detected. The law is not enforced by officials, rather private citizens who are authorized to sue abortion providers involved in facilitating abortions. Texas Democrats' strategy of fleeing to Washington in protest of the highly debated voting rights bill has failed. The Texas legislature passed the voting rights bill yesterday and now it heads to Governor Abbott's desk for a signature. The 2022 edition of the Old Farmer's Almanac is forecasting an extra chilly winter for Americans this year. They have dubbed it the season of shivers. The Almanac's editor says the winter could well be one of the longest and coldest that we have seen in years. A highly anticipated music festival in Tennessee will not happen. Bonnaroo canceled due to Tropical Depression Ida. The cancellation is a big disappointment for fans, but also for the county hosting the event. That event brings in over a million dollars in sales taxes every year. And Windows users get ready for an upgrade. Microsoft says Windows 11 will be released in early October. The company is promising a more Mac-like interface. And that's today's Night at Night. New this morning, our KSAT defenders have just confirmed that a former SAPD lieutenant has been indicted on attempted murder charges in Tennessee. 
That former SAPD lieutenant was fired from the San Antonio Police Department six times. The latest incident happening in 2020. Now Lee Rakin is being charged with attempted murder after shooting an officer in Tennessee. Police were called to Rakin's home for a domestic disturbance call and police say when they got to the scene, they found Rakin with a gun. That's when investigators say the former SAPD lieutenant shot one of the officers. They fired back hitting Rakin. Both were taken to the hospital. He is behind bars facing attempted murder charges. This is a developing story and we will update you if and when we learn more. In the meantime, if you'd like to read more about Reagan's past with the San Antonio Police Department, we have those details on KSET.com. Another top story we are following this morning, a late night three vehicle crash on the city's northeast side sends a family of three and another man to the hospital. Happened just before 10 last night at the intersection of Walsham Road and Mesquite Farm. San Antonio police say the man was traveling too fast, ran a red light and crashed into a pickup truck with the family inside. Another car was also involved. No one was hurt in that vehicle. The three family members in the pickup suffered minor injuries. Police say the man who hit them is in serious condition and has a broken wrist. The San Antonio Food Bank is doing what they can to help our neighbors in Louisiana. This morning, semi loads of food and supplies hit the road. We had a crew there when one of the trucks left. Food Bank says the trucks are carrying lots of water, protein items, snack items, things that don't require electricity, easy open items and cleaning supplies. The trucks are headed to Lafayette, where the goods will be distributed to the rest of the state. And now we go to a Defenders debrief. The story began with a tragic and careless car crash. Lockhart police officers responding to this rural stretch of road on a sunny afternoon in June 2020 encountered a horrific crash. A large Ford truck had sped through a stop sign near State Highway 130, mangling this Honda Accord, critically injuring its driver, Pam Watts, and killing her 56-year-old partner, Jennifer Miller. They got me out, but they never got Jen out. She died 40 minutes later sitting in that vehicle. The other driver, Ryan Hartman, seen here in the front seat of an ambulance after being treated for minor injuries, was handled with kid gloves, according to Watts' attorney, after officers realized Hartman was one of them, a police sergeant from the neighboring town of San Marcos. I'm sorry this had to happen today. The accident's happened. You're, you're in the same uh, line of duty that we are. And while Lockhart PD was ready to release Hartman from the scene with nothing more than a citation for running a stop sign, that changed after his truck was flipped back on its wheels. Officers found a double-sized 24-ounce can of Dos Equis beer, still partially full. I want to cooperate, but at the same time, I'm, I'm already, I caused the death of somebody. And what happened next has some accusing San Marcos City officials of a cover-up. So Dylan Collier joins us now with more. Dylan, good morning. Good morning. Walk us through the agencies involved in, the, in this investigation, how things went south. Sure. So this crash happened in Lockhart, which is east of San Marcos. So the Lockhart Police Department investigated him for whether or not a crime took place. They did charge him with running a stop sign, which is a traffic citation. They did not cite him for having open alcohol in his vehicle, which is a Class C misdemeanor in Texas. They did file the charge eventually with a grand jury for criminal negligent homicide. The issue is that he was no build by uh, a grand jury and the big problem with that is the San Marcos Police Department relied on that indictment to investigate him internally and because there was no indictment they brought him back to work last fall. And what happened once the district attorney got involved? And as we've seen time and again, it happens a lot in San Antonio as well. There's a conflict of interest because you're talking about someone who works in law enforcement. So the district attorney in Caldwell County, which is where the crash took place, had to recuse himself from the case. Uh, so after Lockhart PD filed it, it went to a grand jury in Caldwell County, but was presented by another district attorney from Bastrop County. And when that happens, a lot of times things don't go as fluid as it would if it was someone who's not involved in law enforcement. And that was the case here. He was no billed by a grand jury. The police department had never cited him for the open alcohol container. So you have someone who caused the death of another person in a negligent car crash that he admitted to at the scene who was only ever cited for running a stop sign, which is about a $200 fine.
So at this point, Dylan, you say officials in San Marcos began to change their story based on who they were talking to. Yeah, the emails that we got back from San Marcos City officials were truly eye-opening. Uh, we had them telling the victim who survived the car crash, Pam Watts, that Hartman was being returned to duty because he was no billed by a grand jury. But when the public began to find out about this crash and the fact that a, a sergeant had killed a person and was now working overnight arresting drunk drivers and other people charged with alcohol-related offenses. City officials then came up with another story where, oh, well, we weren't able to discipline him within 180 days, which is state law, and because of that, we had to bring him back to duty. The only issue is he was no billed in November of last year, which was well before the 180 days had taken place since the crash. So that's simply not true. The statements that they put out to the public are simply not accurate. And that's very problematic because this is an official statement put together by city officials about why a person who killed someone else is working the streets and continuing to be a police officer for their department. All right, thank you, Dylan, for joining us yep. this morning. Thank you, Dylan. Right now, it is 908, about 81 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, a handful of new laws go into effect in Texas today. At least one of them will affect your everyday life later, what you need to know. But first, a dire situation unfolding south of Reno, Nevada. Thousands being forced to grab what they can and run as the Caldor fire inches closer. Latest from South Lake Tahoe coming up in your morning headlines. In your morning headlines, an update on the recovery from Hurricane Ida. Now it is about the lack of fuel and electricity. And the Caldor fire is really getting close to home in Lake Tahoe and something gross at an airport. David Sears is here to explain all of this. Morning, Mr. Sears. This makes you want to make sure you wash your hands. Ugh. Oh, this, goodness. This Where's gonna, the hand sanitizer? Uh, a couple of bottles yeah. here. All right. We're going to start with this, though. Some good news from Louisiana. The state's energy company, Intergy, has been able to get power to the eastern part of New Orleans. But there are still some major problems. Gas is in short supply. People sitting in cars, standing in line, waiting for gas. Some folks waiting as many as seven or eight hours. There are lines to get food, limited water, and cell service. With so much debris to clear away and so many services to restore, it's just hard to get supplies. Students at Tulane University in New Orleans loaded buses headed to Houston, and then some continue on home. Classes have been canceled until September 12th. Even if we have power on campus, if power's out on all of New Orleans, you can't stay here. You can't go to, there's no food, there's no supplies. Um, it's, not a, it's not a good situation. The difficulty is the supply chain. They're having the same difficulties getting their supplies here as, as we're having, you know, living here. So it's gonna take some time. One of the hardest hit areas, Grand Isle, currently uninhabitable after surveying the island. Officials say every structure has been damaged or destroyed. The police chief, the mayor, and some first responders, the only ones currently on the island. If you have seen this guy, police would like you to give them a call either in Mississippi or Ohio. He is wanted for assaulting an MSNBC reporter who was covering Hurricane Ida. As of now, we can't show you the video because of certain copyrights. However, I've been able to see it and I'll kind of describe it to you. The reporter is standing there doing his report. Dude allegedly pulls up in his truck. He gets out and you see him walk up right to the reporter, right in his face. And he gets there and the reporter kind of holds his arm up to protect himself and then throws back to the anchors. So you got to give the reporter some credit. He stayed calm. The guy's name is Benjamin Eugene Dagley. He is now wanted in Mississippi for simple assault, disturbing the peace and account of violating an emergency curfew. He is also wanted in Ohio for violating his probation because he wasn't supposed to leave the state. That huge Caldor fire now threatening homes in Lake Tahoe. This fire started closer to Sacramento and is now on the doorstep of folks in Lake Tahoe. The fire moving into Christmas Valley. Folks were urged to evacuate, but some couldn't bear to leave. Joey Anderson doing what he can to help his home from getting burned up. He's one who decided to stay along with his dog Echo. I want to go, but I also want to stay. I know once I leave, I can't get back in. So that's that's the main thing, the reason I've been holding it out. Yeah, the Heavenly Valley Ski Resort has the water system running, trying to keep their resort from going up in flames. And finally, bet you've never seen this before. That is a neatly stacked pile of raw chicken parts, and it is going around the baggage carousel in the Seattle airport. The TSA shared the video. The TSA believes the chicken actually started a cooler. I got out of the cooler and, you know, clucked its way over to the baggage claim. Who knows? <laughs>
They shared it as a reminder, no raw meat, please. Ew. Mm. Isn't that nasty? That's just nasty. That's gross. Your bag touched that. <laughs> so, and you had to pick, pick like, your bag. Please tell us they sanitized the carousel. I'm I hope so. Sure. We don't know for sure, do we? <laughs> I didn't see it, but I, I'm sure they did. I would hope so, I'm sure yeah. TSA would have <laughs> rated down. Well, that would be a sight to see. You're I mean, there waiting for your baggage. And, like, Ew. I don't want to touch my bag. <laughs> and everybody's all, mm -mm, that's no, not mine. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Hands off. Nasty gross. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that on your Wednesday, but hey. That's okay. That's okay. Thank I'll you, David. I'll take a chicken to the airport. Just the messenger. No. Thank you, David. <laughs> right now it's 9, 16, 81 degrees out of the airport. And did we get, we barely got down to 79 this morning? Yeah, early, for, for early maybe like, GMSA? for half an hour we were at 79 maybe, but it was 80 for most of the morning. Yeah, speaking of gross, right? It is uh, sort of gross outside. That, that's like yeah. a salmonella suitcase right there. That's <laughs> Uh, let's look at stage one restrictions. Uh, they are now in place starting today uh, because we did see the aquifer drop down to 660. So what does that mean? You can water before 11 a.m. or after 7 p.m. Handheld watering allowed any day. And this is for SAWS customers. Keep in mind your one day a week watering with the irrigation system that, that depends on your address. And you can see it there on the screen. And we have more information on KSAT.com. Okay, I don't want to get people's hopes up here. I posted on Facebook, hey, who's ready for a cold front? There is not one in the forecast. Let me be clear about that. But we can look at some climatology and see when our first front may be. We look back at the last few years. Early October is a couple there, late September. Last year it was pretty early, September 4th. So you average it all out, late September. Now, this is not a hard, fast rule. This is sort of an ambiguous idea. But on average, that's when we see our first sort of 10 degree temperature drop. We're all hoping for a front at this point, not in the forecast yet. Hopefully down the line as we get into late September, we'll begin to see some fronts gathering and hopefully pushing down into Texas. Average high temperatures as we get into September, and this is just for the month of September. You can see we start off in the low 90s, but then drop off eventually into the upper 80s by the end of the month. Again, due in large part to some fronts moving through. Hopefully that'll be the case this year. Here's the forecast for today. It's just still very summer like 97. The uh, forecast heat index around 102. Pleasanton can go as high as 106, 104 in Carrizo Springs. It's going to be another brutal day when it comes to heat. You can see there are some morning clouds out there. Temperatures 83 Stinson, 79 Kelly, 81 at Randolph, and we've got a good southerly breeze. Those morning clouds have built in. They should scatter out. 82 Pleasanton, 77 Seguin, 81 in New Braunfels. A little bit thicker cloud cover down towards Carrizo Springs there at 79, but that the cloud cover will go away quickly too. Uh, humidity is up just a little bit today. Dew points are in the mid 70s to even upper 70s. So that's why the heat index is going to be a little bit higher. Good news here. We do think the humidity falls off this weekend. And afternoon dew points will be in the 50s in some cases, I think, on Sunday, which will feel a lot better. Heat advisories posted for East Texas, Louisiana. Still a lot of wet weather across the desert southwest. And then you've got uh, the remnants of Ida bringing some very heavy rain up across the northeast. For us, high pressure is in control, and the forecast calls for just a few isolated showers and storms today and again tomorrow. Basically what we've seen the last couple of days, these pop-up showers, most of us, though, stay dry. Here's a look at the forecast. We'll go 97 today, 97 tomorrow, 20% chance of rain, just a 20% chance Friday. Lower humidity this weekend, but of course the trade-off is the air temperature comes up a little bit. We're going to go 99 on Sunday. Rain chances come back into play on Tuesday. And also keep in mind, guys, it is September in which we've seen our all-time highest temperature, 111. Ouch. Back on September 5th in 2000. Yeah. Well, we're getting close. <laughs> I <laughs> guess are. to the triple digits at least. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Yep. Still ahead on GMS at night, we head out to Max Massey live ahead of a fun event this weekend. Max, what's coming up? Good morning, guys. Great event this weekend. We are talking about beer, the second annual San Antonio Beer Run. Here's a little preview. So yes, there is beer, but it is an amazing event. It's meant to help so many local small businesses in and around our area. We'll explain right after the break.
Welcome back. For so many small businesses in and around the Alamo City, this pandemic has not been good for business. Over the years, we've seen local brewery industry grow and a new event here in San Antonio is shining some light on that hard work. So Max Massey joins us live now at South Pitch Beer Company. And Max, we're talking about the second annual beer run, right? That's right, the San Antonio Beer Run. So awesome and so good for the community. So many small businesses, especially during this pandemic. We are joined with co-founders, Erica and Tanner. So guys, for people who don't know, why'd y'all start this? We started SA Beer Run in the midst of 2020 during the whole pandemic. We saw a bunch of our, we were basically our hand was um, restricted with all the restrictions that we did have to with selling beer to go. Um, and on-site consumption. So we did start selling, basically doing cans and um, getting the community involved. We wanted to show that brewers, our relationship with our beer community, as well as the patrons that we can grow in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah, no, I love that. Can I see uh, yeah. the beer run can? Look at that, that's awesome. Very cool, of course, Cactus Land, one of the participating breweries. Now, guys, this is the second annual year. How can people get involved? So really, uh, go to the website, sabeerrun.com, mm -hmm. register, um, and you'll basically be entered in our like email newsletter. And then uh, go to your favorite brewery, pick up a passport, uh, get it stamped. If you get seven of the 13 participating breweries, you get a free glass, which is available at Roadmap Brewing at the end of it. While supplies, while supplies last. last. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so basically just like go out and drink at your favorite brewery and try to learn more about you know, the other breweries that are participating. Now, we were talking earlier and you guys had a great point. You can drink anywhere, but this is really meant to help small businesses and local businesses. Exactly. I mean, we're all, we're, we're small, we're all upcoming. We have a lot of new breweries popping up every day. We all have a great relationship and we want, we want to get our community into craft beer. We also want y'all to enjoy everything that we all have. I mean, we're all so different. We all are serving beer, but we're, we're very, very different in, in so many ways. And we just want y'all to explore maybe a different spot than you're used to. Yeah, and Yingling's great, but you know, these people <laughs> live here and they actually, you know, the money that you're spending at these breweries mm -hmm. will go back into the community and to pay, you know, people who are cleaning kegs or people who own the place, mm -hmm. so. Support local, please. Absolutely. All right, guys, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions about how it works or, you know, the organization, we're going to have all that. Just head to KSAT.com. And, of course, so much more on the news at noon. Back to you guys. We look forward to it. Thank you, Max. Here's more ahead on GMSA at 9. Texans are under a slew of new laws this morning. We break down a few of them after the break. And some surprising cuts in the NFL, including that man, Cam Newton. We'll talk about that with David and RJ coming up a little bit later in the newscast. Welcome back. We're just chatting about the hundreds of new laws here in Texas now in effect. And there's a good chance at least one of them or several will impact your daily life. So some major changes to our state laws were inspired by the pandemic, while others are related to guns, education and medicinal marijuana. So RJ Marcus joins us live now in the studio to break down some of the key laws in the books right now. Yeah, good morning, guys. A uh, total of 666 new state laws are now in effect. Yes, yeah, 666. I know that is a weird number, but they were debated, passed and signed during the 87th Texas legislature. So we have a full rundown on KSAT.com, but here's some of the laws that are getting some attention this morning. The first is House Bill 1927. That was referred to as the constitutional carry law. This law now allows Texans 21 years and older to carry handguns without training or a license as long as they are not legally prevented from doing so, including people with felony or domestic violence convictions. The law basically removes the requirement of getting a state issued license in order to carry a handgun in public. Background checks are still required by federal law when someone buys a firearm from a licensed dealer. The next one is Senate Bill 8, which was referred to as the heartbeat bill. This new law bans abortions after a fetal heartbeat can be detected, which, some, which, can, which can sometimes be as early as five to six weeks. Victims of sexual assault are not exempt, meaning they have to carry the pregnancy to term once a fetal heartbeat is detected, and doctors are not allowed to perform abortions without first performing a test to check for that heartbeat. The only exemption to this rule is if a doctor believes there is a medical emergency which makes the abortion necessary necessary. Abortion rights advocates and providers are suing the state over this. They say the law is one of the most extreme across the country. 
And moving on to House Bill 929, that relates to police body cameras. This bill requires officers to keep body cameras on during the entirety of an active investigation. Before today, officers were allowed to turn off their cameras if they were in a non-confrontational encounter with a person. The new law requires them to record any part of an investigation. And officers can no longer use chokeholds or excessive force when arresting someone unless it's to prevent an injury to themselves or a bystander. So a few other laws here of note. A new Texas law expands the use of medical marijuana. People like veterans who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, cancer patients, and other medical conditions that have been approved for certain research programs will have access to medical marijuana. And doctors will be able to prescribe low-level THC cannabis for qualifying patients. And this one's another one related to schools. Pre-K classes are now capped at 22 students. That is the same maximum size of other elementary school grades. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Again, more than 600 new laws are now on the books, guys, and you can find much more information on our website, ksat.com. One of our digital journalists, Mary Claire Patton, put together a pretty comprehensive list of nine state laws that are really kind of getting the attention of everybody. All right. Thank you, RJ. A, Thanks, lot, a lot of them. A lot of them, yes. <laughs> thank you, sir. Right now, 81 degrees out of San Antonio International Airport, and we're seeing tons and tons of humidity out there. On this first day of September, Justin. First day of September, and it's almost like you can see the humidity out there. It is extremely thick this morning, and that gives us a little bit of pause because with that hum much humidity and those warm temperatures this afternoon, that heat index is going to jump above 100, probably starting to creep into some danger levels there. Let's look outside right now at the numbers. 80 Boulevardy, 80 Canyon Lake, 79 Comfort, 77 Bandera, 79 Uvalde. We do have a nice morning cloud deck overhead. That'll continue to scatter out here over the next couple of hours. Today is a CPS Energy Peak Energy Demand Day. They're asking that you lower your energy use between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, there will be a lot of demand on the power grid today thanks to the heat. Sun starting to shine through now and you can expect that heat index to be 100 plus today. A stray storm can't be ruled out but isn't likely. Rest of the week, same story. Stray storm or two during the afternoon. As we head into the Labor Day weekend, Hot with lower humidity. Here's a look at the specifics. 98 Saturday, 99 Sunday, 98 on Monday. Mostly sunny Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Great for any outdoor plans other than it being hot that you may have. Guys. Thanks, Justin. Forbearance programs will be coming to an end for millions of American homeowners who were able to pause their mortgage payments under the CARES Act temporarily. A new rule from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will help to ensure mortgage companies provide opportunities to help people from losing their homes. Ivan Edda tells us more on this week's Money It's Personal. If you're one of the millions of homeowners who fell behind on your mortgage payments due to the coronavirus pandemic, you may be wondering what options you have after forbearance programs end. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued a rule to ensure mortgage servicers are providing opportunities to help people stay in their homes. The new rule states most servicers cannot start the foreclosure process before January 1st without first contacting homeowners and evaluating their complete applications for options to help them. Mortgage servicers must provide homeowners with the following information. The date their forbearance program will end, the options they have for repaying missed payments and avoiding foreclosure, and information on how to contact free housing counseling services. While federal forbearance programs under the CARES Act were only available to homeowners with federally backed mortgages, the CFPB says its new rule applies regardless of that factor. However, the new rule does not apply to investment properties or home equity lines of credit as well as reverse mortgages. If your servicer is unable to reach you after trying for three consecutive months, they may be able to start the foreclosure process before January 1st, 2022. The CFPB FPB recommends homeowners reach out to their mortgage servicers as soon as possible for solutions before it's too late. For this week's Money It's Personal, I'm Ivan Herrera. KSAT 12 News. Time check 936, about 81 degrees. You're watching TMSA at 9. A new episode of KSAT Explains is out. A preview after the break. Nine thirty-nine. A brand new episode of KSAT Explains is out right now. 
And this week, the team is focusing on homeless encampments and the debate over whether to allow them. Myra Arthur and RJ Marcus give us a preview. It is a sensitive issue that a lot of people have a lot of opinions about how to address, especially when it comes to the issue of homeless encampments. Now with a statewide ban on such encampments, that is the focus of this week's episode of KSET Explains. We talk to local leaders, local homeless outreach workers about why even with that statewide ban, they don't anticipate things changing all that much for San Antonio. Yeah, Myra, as you mentioned, this is a not one size fits all solution here and there are a lot of different, uh, there's complications when it comes to it. We take into account mental health, uh, substance abuse. There are a lot of things that comes with mental health, but there are people on the ground that are helping out and taking these small steps to try and fix this problem here in the San Antonio area. And I felt that with this episode, we definitely looked at all angles and we try and figure out what is best moving forward when it comes to the homeless population in San Antonio. And that is one of the most eye-opening parts of this episode to me, the fact that our cameras were there. RJ, you were part of this as well, walking along with these homeless outreach workers who know the names of the people living on the streets. They know their stories. They know their history. They know what struggles they face. And they work with them day in and day out, building those relationships to try to get them the help that they need, trying to get them to a point where they want to receive that assistance. And a lot of people want to help in San Antonio. So we also talk about what some solutions look like, how the community can can get involved and make a difference right here at home. Yeah, Myra, this was an episode that obviously being on the ground with some of these outreach workers, it's definitely an eye-opening experience and definitely a different way to view uh, homelessness in San Antonio. So you mentioned the solutions and just a path moving forward as now we get ready to maybe hopefully come out of the pandemic and figure out where we are with homelessness in our area. And we take a look at that too. Has the pandemic really increased homelessness? We're breaking down the numbers all in this episode of KSAT Explains out right now. You can check it out at ksat.com slash explains or watch it anytime on demand on the KSAT TV app. Local artist wants to see her work stretch from windows to the walls. Catalina Zapparima earned her living painting decorations on the windows of businesses all across town, but she has her sights set on something bigger, painting murals. She actually grew up dabbling in the field, helping her uncle cover walls with artwork. After getting a taste of doing a couple on her own recently, Zamarifa says she is ready to make her mark on San Antonio in a big way. Katrina Weber introduces us to Zamarifa's story in this week's edition of If These Walls Could Talk. You can check it out right now on KSAT.com. And later today, we will be hosting a KSET Community Town Hall discussing food insecurity in Bear County. Max Massey and Sarah Costa will be joined by the CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank, Eric Cooper, and other experts on nutrition and health. If you have any questions for the panelists, you can submit them right now on KSET.com. Again, our Feeding Tomorrow Town Hall is today at 2 p.m. The latest on recovery in Louisiana is coming up later in the show. Here at home, just kind of hot to start our September. And Justin is finalizing his maps here. It looks like he's working on a tropical storm. And there Almost he is. There. He's ready to go. Yeah, we do have a new tropical storm out there. It's uh, Larry, guys. It's out in the Atlantic. Looks like it'll become a hurricane. Probably a non-factor, though, because it's not expected to make any interaction with land. Well, let's take a look at a picture here. This is a good one coming in from Skywatcher. It always sends in great shots. Uh, this side of San Antonio says the sun always wins. He's right about that. You can see some of those morning clouds, some of that thick humidity this morning and sun shining through. Thank you so much for that picture. And there is the scene as we look uh, over San Antonio, over the airport. I think the uh, lens is a little dirty there, but uh, we've got some mostly cloudy skies with the sun starting to shine through 81 degrees. Dew point is at 75. That number is important, a little bit higher than yesterday. So we know that the heat index will really be an issue today. feels like 87 out there and you see some of those morning clouds starting to break up here around Bear County. 85 Stinson, already really warm there. 85 Pleasanton, 77 right now in Seguin. 79 Uvalde. Clear skies in Del Rio, 82 there. And dew points, I mentioned that they're extremely high here. We're talking upper 70s in Pleasanton, 78 in New Braunfels. That is some very thick air. So when you factor that in, we already have a heat index even at this hour. Feels like 87 here in town, feels like 99 in Gonzales and it's what 9:45 in the morning. That is brutal as we uh, start September here. 
Here's the good news. Dew point does come down a little bit. These are afternoon dew points, and I think by the time we get into Saturday, Sunday and Monday, these dew points will drop down potentially into the 50s. That would put us in the pleasant category. Now the flip side to that air temperatures going to come up a little bit. It's going to be more of a dry heat this weekend. Still hot nonetheless. Here is the setup heat advisory stretch from parts of Oklahoma all the way down to New Orleans, an area that uh, is going to be hot again today as they do clean up there. Still some showers and storms out west, some flash flood watches there, and then a lot of heavy rain from the northeast. Flash flood watches stretch from Washington, D.C. up to New York as the remnants of Ida work in that direction. For us here in Texas, it's mostly just heat. Heat index is going to be bad no matter where you go. San Angelo, Waco, Dallas, Tyler, Houston, you name it. That heat index is going to be above 100 this afternoon, and that includes us here where the heat index could jump up to around 102 this afternoon. Here's what the forecast looks like. Some isolated showers and storms possible. We saw a few of those yesterday. Not much. It'll be few and far between, uh, but there is that chance there today and again tomorrow. We do it all again. Very similar setup tomorrow with just a 20% chance of rain during the afternoon for your Thursday. Uh, we mentioned Larry. It's out there right there. Winds at 30 miles per hour and uh, it is moving west. It is forecast to become a hurricane. Category three hurricane, uh, but here's the good news. I think it stays out over open water. Probably again, as I said, uh, a non factor when it comes to interaction with land, and that's a good thing. Now the little area down in the Caribbean, the hurricane center is watching about a 30% chance of development there. We'll keep an eye on it uh, right now. It looks pretty disorganized. 97 degrees today, tomorrow, 20% chance rain, 20% chance Friday, lower humidity as we talked about this weekend and forecast highs 99 there on Sunday, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. We have a clearer picture of who's on the final roster for the Cowboys and the Texans. And there were a few surprises after the NFL official cut down day. RJ and David are back to break down the moves by <laughs> Dallas and Houston. And what's next? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know, Mark, is it really that clear? <laughs> <laughs> clear as can be maybe clear right now. Not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but the Nooch, David, the Nooch era, well, the Danucci era. Over. We, yeah, we didn't even get to know you, Ben Danucci. <laughs> yeah, well, the yeah. defense did because they picked off like four wow. passes, three in one game in preseason. So that pretty much yep. uh, took care of him. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what we're referring to is Ben DiNucci, Cowboys backup quarterback. He has been cut along with Garrett Gilbert. Uh, that was their other backup there. So no DiNucci, no Garrett Gilbert. David, Cooper who are we going to go with? your uh, backup quarterback man. for the Dallas Cowboys, <laughs> mm. which is great because that means Dak Prescott's actually going to play at some point this year. <laughs> if they've got him listed as the starter, if you look at the depth chart, I'm like, all right, that's exciting. I can't wait to see Dak Prescott actually get on the field and play. It'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. it'll be good. No offense so. to Cooper Rush, but if uh, Dak gets hurt, then the Cowboys uh, might be in some serious yeah, trouble here. Yeah. Um, here's the amazing thing about if you look at the Cowboys roster, of course, they still have like they got their 53 man roster, but they got guys that are hurt. They got guys that are in COVID protocol. Mm -hmm. They got guys that are on that pup list thing. And so it's it's got <laughs> TJ Vasher, by the way, Texas Tech University wide receiver is hurt so he's still mm. on their roster but mm. but he's hurt so anyway uh all 11 of their draft picks this this year remember we were bragging about all these draft picks they yeah. had all 11 of them made the team which is unheard of wow. usually if you get 11 guys if you can get two or three of them to make your team that's pretty good all 11 of them made it yeah also want to mention terrence Steele, the offensive lineman he's mm -hmm. from Steele high school he's made this team as well so congrats to yeah. terrence Steele. but a uh, big one out there david cam newton gets uh, yeah, cut well, by the patriots go to texas talk to the cowboys oh we're going to texas well is this where <laughs> let's go to the texans, okay. the texans right. and it's all about uh, one guy pretty much with the uh, houston texans deshaun yeah. watson Deshaun watson he made the team i yeah not not a shock but <laughs> At the same time, you just wonder what is going to happen here with this franchise. And uh, there were reports that he was on the trading block. Turns out they were asking for too much. And then other reports saying that, you know what, that wasn't really true. So Deshaun just uh, on ice right now, pretty much. It's just, it's, it's a tough situation. And when you go into a season like this and not real sure who's doing what, I mean, you know, how do you expect the Texans to be able to focus and, and get ready for, you know, what should be a playoff season? It could have been a playoff season, but. Maybe not now. Yeah, tough deal there for the Texans. Uh, so they end up keeping two quarterbacks, Tyrod Taylor and uh, Davis Mills. That is the rookie. I'm assuming that Taylor is going to start. But, David, they cut your guy, man. Kiki QT. Kiki QT. no longer. Uh, your Texas so, uh, Tech. He was injured a lot last year, and that's a problem. So, uh, you know, 
That's all right. If TJ Vassar <laughs> makes the Cowboys and Kiki Cute, then we trade one for one. So at least we got some yeah. tech guys so, in the NFL. So, David, the question Cam Newton. Now let's get to Cam. Yeah, all right. Here we go. Okay. Does Cam so Newton go with uh, maybe? So is he coming to Texas? So, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> see, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there about Cam Newton. Apparently, from get, reading from what Boston newspapers and TV stations are saying, he didn't get fully vaccinated. Right. And they figured that out because he had to get tested every day if you're not fully vaccinated. And he didn't get tested one day when he went to Atlanta to visit family and his kids mm -hmm. and stuff. And so there's a lot of controversy with that. So they cut him. And now the question is, did they cut him because he wasn't fully vaccinated or did they cut him because the guy that they drafted from Alabama is just that good? I think it, I think it's a little bit of both, even though Bill Belichick already came out. And of course, he's going to say they didn't cut him because he's not vaccinated. I think they just are saying, hey, it's time to move on or try and see what Mac Jones can do for them. But uh, it'll be interesting. There's been some talk about maybe Cam Newton, the Texans taking a chance on Cam Newton and maybe the Cowboys uh, backup situation there. I don't know. Well, you're on Mark. target uh, there, RJ, because I just read a Yahoo Sports article and of the five like possible oh. destinations for Cam, both Dallas and Houston are listed along with uh, the Ravens the Broncos, and the Washington football team, which would reunite Cam with Ron Rivera. But if I'm not mistaken, Jerry Jones has come out and says his players are going to get vaccinated, right? He said that. I mean, I, again, I, I don't know. It just depends. I mean, if Dak Prescott, I, if he was unvaccinated, which Dak has not publicly said whether he is or not, I don't think Dak would have gotten <laughs> would have gotten the boot. But I do know that. I mean, uh, I, it'll be interesting because the contact tracing thing, yeah. that's also a big part of this. It just and, says here that Newton makes sense for the Cowboys if they're looking for a more proven option, especially if there's concern about Prescott's yeah. uh, long-term health mm. and durability. Well, sure. If, I, mean, I mean, you know, I mean, he wouldn't be a backup if, if it was up here, a backup. Right. You know, if he could be a backup mentally. Yeah. You yeah. know. So the other thing is uh, Michael Jordan got cut. Oh, <laughs> what? I'm serious. I kid you not. Know, Michael even know. Jordan. There's a exactly. center for the Bengals uh -huh. named Michael Jordan, and he got uh -huh. cut. So I, you know, I was stunned yesterday on it. Yeah, but <laughs> you see that come across no. the headlines. Yeah. The sound of that just. Just and funny. The Michael Jordan's like, yeah, yeah. you guys are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, that's never happening, yeah. no matter what sport Definitely it is. Not. Yeah. <laughs> David, RJ, thank yeah. you guys. Thanks, guys. Barely right now, 952, about 82 degrees. And details on how your favorite hill country destination could end up on a Monopoly game. Article on KSAT.com, your favorite hill country destination could wind up on a Monopoly board. That's right. They want to know what you think. So the company wants the public's help deciding which hill country destination should be featured on the game. Winning Moves, a manufacturer and a licensing from Hasbro, is bringing this game to stores next year. And so the game will include a customized community chest and chance playing cards, and some scores will be dedicated to some of the iconic and much loved Hill Country landmarks. All right, so they're 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 pitching for ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's expected to hit store shelves in March, mm -hmm. and those who submit ideas have the opportunity to win prizes. And we have an email address and a link, I think, on our website. At least yes. the, the email address. But you you thought of a really good one. Uh, which, well, I, the Duck Crossing, <laughs> Bernie. Yes, uh, and in green. And in green, the dance hall. The dance hall. The dance hall. Yeah. It's way better than anything we yeah, can I up, with. Come up with. Anything. Especially Justin. Yeah, it was. <laughs> the deadline is September 22nd.